So welcome to lecture number two. So let me start off today's lecture by reminding you a few things from last lecture and then just carry on. So the last lecture, we were trying to understand some of the details of linear factors that we use. So we got rid of the transverse integrating all the We just thought about a problem that we really am here. The invariant mass of the photon is much bigger than um, the speed of the time scale. The statement of the factorization in this case is that the cross section is the rapidity of Q squared can be written for these integrals that we at half time and the part number equation function that involve equation scale U and a short distance piece, separation of the physics of the blue scale, which is time to P, that goes into these part number distributions. And the short distance physics that goes into this cross section. I didn't say last time, but I, I should have emphasized that this is there's an expansion that goes on to get this. We really we really are working for reading order in the expansion in lambda over Q. Um, so there was this picture that I drew. We talked about how, from the point of view of one class moving particle, the other one looks like close in line. That's what leads to this factorization of the product of PDFs, where the ith parton gets to see the Wilson line on the other side. Same is on one side of the cut, this is the conjugate amplitude. I didn't really go through to write this picture last time. I meant to say here that if we have Wilson lines that go from minus infinity to zero, and then from minus infinity to some position B. And then when we combine those Wilson lines together, they just become a product. They're in the same direction despite the picture. So here I've drawn them like they look in the same direction, they're along the same path. And so then we go from zero to minus infinity and then minus infinity back to B. And the parts that are overlapping here are going to go to infinity cancel. And that's why we end up with a line that's just finite going from zero to B. And that's the line that shows up here in this formula. It connects the quark field that I've drawn here very explicitly. Here's a quark field. Here's the IMR field, IMR phi. And the Wilson line is connected to the two top. And all together, this operator here is what the matrix element of that operator between proton states is what is really the definition of the part of the distribution function. And it's nicely gauge invariant the presence of that Wilson line. And then for a transforming it, this is a position space for a transforming the B minus into this momentum fraction to C of the proton momentum B plus. So this is the momenta fraction of the, momentum of the proton. We get our momentum dependent part of distribution function. There's some normalization that has to go on. All this is there. Uh, that's, that's the basic idea of this. Also, a question. Yeah. Is it obvious why B minus and C? P are conjugate, are Fourier conjugates? Yeah, um, this is the way that the light cone components work. So you always have plus times minus when you're dotting two things together. And that's what's going on here. So you have a position which is minus dotted into a momentum which is plus. And it's just the usual P dot B, but taking one component of it, it's relevant here. The light cone components take a little bit of getting used to it. Always multiplying plus. Yeah. How can we need to separate it from a subject that is gauge invariant? Yeah, so you may, you may or may not be able to read it to see, but uh, the trick is so you know how quark field transforms under a gauge transformation, right? It'll give you some matrix that's at the position of the field. Likewise for this one. So if the Wilson line wasn't there, it wouldn't be gauge invariant because the matrices to get would be at two different positions. Therefore, they wouldn't cancel. And the way the Wilson line works is it transforms only on its ends. And it has exactly the right transformation on each of the ends to cancel the gauge transformation of the quarks. So that this line is uh, actually then, but it comes in uh, general gauge theory. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at Peskin and Schroeder, there's like a chapter section on Wilson lines and it goes through in a lot of detail. How they transform. Um, but yeah, you need to know that. We're going to just see what I'm saying. Okay, so today what I, I'm going to go back to transverse momentum and I'm going to do it in two steps. So, so first, I'll talk about a simple case. So, 
where we add back transverse momentum, but we let it be big, of order of the Q squared scale. And so we could be more differential than what I wrote in case A, it was case A. It could be differential in the transverse momentum with really not changing very much about the formula. So write it again, uh, a little thicker maybe. It's got the same structures over there. And all I'm changing in this case is I'm making the short distance piece more differential. And I'm allowing Q T squared to be big. So my corrections in this case, I can consider lambda Q C D to be still in the numerator. And it could be Q T squared or it could be Q squared in the denominator. It's a both big and so all I've done is I've made a more differential measurement on the final state photon, but I'm still counting this new scale that I've introduced or this new measurement as if it's hard. And therefore, the only thing it's affecting is the short distance cross section, differential cross sections at the fourth level, and not the long distance physics blue pieces. Now, that's not what we want to do in TMD physics. In TMD physics, we want to do something a little bit differently, and that is to think about the situation where Q squared is much bigger than Q squared. Okay. And when Q T, so now we have two scales here, Q squared and T squared, and this is going to lead to TMDs. It's like we have a multi scale probe. We have our original probe at the hard scale Q. And now we have a secondary probe at a smaller momentum scale QT. Now there's kind of, you know, here we were comparing QT and lambda QCD. So there's sort of another scale that we can compare here. And TMDs are relevant both in the situation where QT squared is much bigger than lambda QCD, which is sort of a determinative situation, as well as for M. Either one of these cases is okay. So QT squared could be a border lambda QCD squared, or it could be much bigger than lambda QCD squared, in which case there's three scales. Um, in this case, the TMDs are going to have the transverse momentum scale is perturbative. And in this case, the transverse momentum scale is going to be non perturbative. But TMDs cover both cases. Okay, so let me write down how this cross section looks if we make this situation. And we kind of had a sketchy version of this. I'm going to make it more and more precise as the lectures proceed. So now I'm going to put the scale mu into the formula that we had before. Try to keep color coding everything the same way. So now we have the TMD PDFs showing up. There was this delta function, and for convenience, let me just do the, one of the integrals over that delta function when the stick resulting here. So previously, this was some K prime. If I do the K prime integral, that just sticks in of the delta function, QT minus KT argument. And just like there was mu's over here, Having to do with renormalization and setting scales, there's going to be views here as well. So I just add them. So those are the again, you, you don't want oops. to create over QT. Right? Okay. So that now that we have the TMD uh, PDFs showing up, and what am I expanding in this case? <clears throat> so I just said we're expanding in QT squared over Q squared. Lambda QCD squared is still much smaller than Q squared as well, uh, just like it was in case A. <laughs> but we're not making any uh, assumption a priori about whether we're in this case or this case, this formula is valid for both cases as far as comparison between QT squared and lambda QCD squared is concerned. Okay, so there's this new thing in front. There's now an equal sign and not a sim sign. 
Uh, so let me explain some of the things here. And one thing I want to ex explain also is why do I have XA here? Over here, I had an integral where I could see A and could see A was bigger than XA. But now I don't have that integral. I just have a canvas momentum integral, which I explained last time. And this argument is just set equal to XA. So why is that? Why is there no CBA? CB? So the reason that this is, is because in this situation, the CA and CB just generally set the XA and XB. They're just equal. And if I go to the kind of picture that we had last time, you may remember we were thinking about these types of pictures and we were thinking about having some radiation and it was that radiation that could be responsible for having CA bigger than XA. But something here has changed in this case. And that is that we're making a transverse momentum measurement on the final stage. So when I, last time when I took this original diagram, I said there's two regions to it. There's a hard region. That was what was responsible for CA being greater than XA. And then there was a soft region. Now, when I look at this diagram, there's actually only one group. Not two. And draw them on. It's the blue region. And the reason that we have that is because this blue on that crosses the cut is measured. It's the transverse momentum is measured. And it's whatever it is, let me call it KT prime. It can't be bigger than the total transverse momentum that I'm measuring, or it should be a quarter it. If I have one going like this, you know, there's some QT here and it'll have minus QT. Well, I call it KT prime. Imagine there's more than one blue on. There's only one blue on, it would just be equal and opposite of KT. QT down here. Um, so the KT prime would be actually minus QT. And so hence it would be a quarter QT. But it's much less than Q. Since it's much less than Q, it can't cause at the hard scale, it can't be a red flaw. It can't cause at the hard scale some change in the longitudinal momentum fraction. It's constrained to be part of the PDF because it's a small, it's got small trans, it's constrained to have small transverse momentum. And therefore, it goes. This gluon goes into the blue object. It doesn't modify the short distance physics, and therefore, there's no integral associated to the short distance physics. That's why it's different than the other case. And you can see that the short distance physics here is also different. Here we had sort of this whole cross section. Here we just have this object that I called H. And that object H actually is purely virtual corrections now. So, you ask what's going into the hard scale. Because the, the hard scale gluons can't cross the cut because of this constraint, they're just constrained to just purely virtual. So they can give some virtual correction. Maybe they could have some gluon like this, not just to our blue quarks, fluctuation at short distance, our lepton pair. So this is some short distance loop with the scale Q. And that can go into this hard function H, but it's just virtual diagrams. I know the little diagrams that diagram like that's allowed. But then where the orange gluon or the magenta gluons are crossing the cut. Yes. So these go into the H. And so this H just is actually a form factor. Typically people calculate in the MS bar scheme exactly if set equal to a fork form factor, the square of a fork, square of an amplitude form factor, level form factor. And so that's what this, this H unit is. It does have perturbative correction to it, but it just acts like a multiplicative factor on the cross section. Questions? Yep. 
statement that the XA like you're talking about transfer momentum, but XA is like for linear. So yeah. why transfer part momentum being small means that the collinear the afternoon cannot take big uh, collinear momentum. Right. Well, this is one kind of like this thing is a, some particle across the cut and it has you know, physical momentum, but it's like got one form of momentum, right? And uh, if it had like a yeah, it's it's kinematics are being constrained by the constraint that it has small transverse momentum. If it had large, it, in order for it to really give a virtual correction, give a correction that would go into this factor here, it would have to have large transverse momentum. That's the statement. Um, so the, the transverse momentum constraint actually has an influence on the longitudinal structure of the building. Did you want to do the The gluon is on shell when it crosses the cut, that's true. Yeah. And that constraint does come in. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit more detail and get a little bit more into the kinematics of it later. Hopefully by the end of the lecture. Maybe like your answer your question more clear. Okay, good. We have these two versions, A and B, and you might ask, is there any kind of information that we can get between the two versions? Well, they're, they're set up for different regions, but what if we took version B and we just said, oh, let's expand in QT, much less than Q, version B, and see what happens. Then it'll look like the assumptions that we made in, in C. So we'll, we'll keep boundary Q to be small. We'll think about the perturbative QT. That was one of the assumptions. Okay, we'll just try to add this expansion. Okay. okay, so there have to be some kind of relation actually between these formulas. If I do that type of expansion. <laughs> I forgot to say one thing, but that would work. I get there. Let me write one more version of this formula down that will be useful later. I just wanted to write it down in Fourier space. You see, when you have a function like this, it's got a shifted convolution like structure like this, it's much easier to think about in Fourier space. <laughs> We, we can do a Fourier transform of the Chardon distribution function and its transverse momentum. And then everything becomes a product. Products are much simpler to deal with integrals. Like that, that version of the formula here at the bottom of the board for later. So this version of the formula just has a product of the quantum distribution functions with a, a BT variable replacing the transverse momentum variable. BT is a position, transverse position. I do the Fourier transform of each of these, and that's why they have to build on top. Then it becomes a simple product with the overall Fourier transform back to momentum space. Okay. All right, so let's come back to this question. <clears throat> what you can see is that there's going to be some kind of relation between our T and D PDFs and our longitudinal PDFs. In order for those two formulas to be compatible with each other, something has to uh, give a relation. So in this particular limit, that's indeed what happens. So the, the equation that allows them to be related. I'll write it again in the empty space. Find it was equally well valid in the session space.
this formula. So this formula is valid when taking QT squared to be much bigger than lambda QCT squared of the recent expansion. And it's saying that the part of the T of D PDF that's associated to that large perturbative scale, that's something that I can again think about calculating perturbatively. And the non perturbative physics is going to be down at this lambda QCD scale. So it's kind of like the story we were talking about last time, where we're factoring perturbative physics for non perturbative physics. And in this case, the perturbative physics is just being factored out of this TMD PDF. And it gives this object here, factored in the perturbation theory. In fact, it's been calculated to three loop order. People that did that calculation were all members of my group at one point, and, she, um, and I wasn't involved. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I don't know if I would have known. Um, so this this coefficient is let me, capturing the transverse momentum from what I talked about last time of those perturbatively radiated gluons, not the intrinsic transverse momentum, because we made an assumption that the intrinsic transverse is smaller than this. Large transverse momentum. This formula is capturing that large piece. Okay. And so if you take this formula and you plug it in here, and you can sort of see that you can think about doing this KT integral and just sort of organizing, plug it in twice, once you take objects, organizing it in these two objects times whatever else you get, that is sort of saying that I can get some overall relation between the two formulas that can sell schematically. Integral over transverse momentum that these various three functions multiply together. Every one of them is each of the PDFs. That's equal to this short distance cross section. The other one. Limits. So that formula will be useful. This formula is actually needed to make the non-logical predictions. So I want to explain where it comes from. Yeah. I just wanted to find out in the last term there, the square uh, term there on. Yeah. QT, are we approximating that QT squared is equal to KT squared or we should have KT? Yeah, you can think of QT squared and KT squared. Yeah, I wrote KT and thank you. This would be KT. Right. Thanks. So I could write the same formula down in BT. If this was a BT, this would be a BT, and the KT in the denominator would be a BT in the numerator. The same formula would be true with a slightly fully transformed version of these coefficients. Okay. So now we're seeing the TMDs come um, into the story. This is all what I called layer one of the TMD. And so the next thing I want to get into what I'll call layer two, digging a little bit more deeper into the kinematics of transverse And in particular, whenever I've written them, I've always sort of been a little bit sketchy. And some dots might be wondering, what are those dots? Get into what those dots are now. It's the next stage in the your notes. Yeah. In the integral from x to one, you have dz over z. Uh, Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, maybe I can do. So when you're trying to translate it between B and C, yeah. these are like the separation of scales that you, the assumption that you use for effective field theories. Yeah. I kind of don't understand what we actually did because when I, when I would want to bridge that, I'd say, is there any parameter or variable that I can make smaller or bigger to take me from one to the other? Is yeah. that what you secretly did and I just don't understand it? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so here, this object, there's KT and lambda QCD, and they're, they're not, we're not making any assumption about one being bigger than the other. It's just all lumped together in a single object. Now, on the right-hand side, I'm expanding in QT, KT, KT, much bigger than lambda QCD. And now I'm able to separate the physics at KT, which goes into this coefficient, from the physics at lambda QCD, which goes into these longitudinal distributions. That's uh, not the formula. Okay, so let's, section two is going to be talking about factorizations. 
scale, but introducing the notion of rapidity scales. Okay, so. So it turns out we can dig a little harder into this idea of like what kind of radiation here <laughs> is allowed. Sort of argued that hard radiation is not allowed because the transverse momentum being smaller than the apple Q. But what type, type of radiation is allowed? Well, I drew it as blue, but what exactly is this blue radiation? That's what I want to dig into a little deeper in this section. And it turns out there's two different types of radiation that are allowed. Two different types of importance. What is this blue? Radiation. Well, so positive. Maybe I'll introduce some more colors once we start distinguishing it. So it could either be collinear or soft. So let me define for you what those terms mean. So collinear radiation has momenta that's as follows. You think about it in terms of how big are the plus, minus, and perp components of radiation. And the plus component is just as big as the, as the overall pro, proton plus component. It's got a much smaller minus. And the transverse is worth 50, 50. Everything is same here, KT, QT. I'm just going to write QT. So, in order for it to contribute to the radiation that in, in the picture of the very rays, it should have a small transverse component. And but the, so the choice here is about this large, this plus component being large. The other possibility is that all the components are similar in size, and they're all for QT. And the constraint that I'm imposing on this radiation is that it's allowed to cross the cut. And that means that the off shell, which says that 2p plus times p minus equal to pt squared, by making a choice about how big the plus is, it's either as big as the proton or maybe just the same size as the transverse. And it, then the minus just follows from that equation. Size of the minus. So that's not well, something you choose. So both of these uh, types of radiation can actually cross the cut. Physically, what are they corresponding to? So in this case, you have your very energetic quark inside the proton, and it does some radiate, it emits some radiation, and the angle at which it emits the radiation is very small. You can think of that angle as the magnitude of Q, QT divided by Q. So it's a small parameter. We're expanding in QT much less than Q. So this is collimated, and therefore we call it collimated. And in the second case, well, I'll keep using the blue for the collinear, but now I need another color for the soft. In the second case, we just have some radiation that could be at any angle. All the components are comparable size, but it's gotten a small magnitude of so what we call it soft. So it's not collimated like the first case, it's not got a larger momentum like the first case. Soft, small, but it still has a transverse momentum, the same size as there, so it can contribute to the transverse momentum the final state that we are talking about. And when you go through factorization, you have to think about these two, two different types of momentum regions because they can both contribute to the, the observable you're looking at. And so the key thing that you might wonder is how do I distinguish them when I'm thinking about doing my quantum field theory calculations? And the thing that distinguishes these is rapidity. <laughs> so we're going to have the linear radiation. So remember, capital Y was uh, is rapidity. Rapidity was defined by half the log of the plus component, which is Q, divided by the minus component, puts another Q upstairs, so it makes the Q squared. Is Q2 squared downstairs. So that's plus over minus. Plus divided by minus gives this. And that's big because this log is pretty big. Q squared is much bigger than QT squared. In particular, it's bigger than the Y that you would approximate for 
a soft radiation, which is closer to zero, which you're taking something that's order one in here. Okay, so one set of Ys is bigger than the other set of Ys, and therefore you can distinguish between these two types of radiation because you're going to have to make different, slightly different types of expansions in these two cases. You need to distinguish them. You can distinguish it using a cutoff in rapidity. So we can introduce a rapidity cutoff. I'll call it new. And we can think about just imposing the cutoff. And typically it's done in different ways, but maybe it made it convenient. At least it corresponds to something that's in the use of literature. Just to think about doing it. Two t times e to the two y, get rid of logarithm, make things have dimension one. It's slightly more convenient. So this new parameter is dimension one, just like mu uh, the cutoff mu did. And this thing is large because this exponential is large. This exponential here is order one. And so we can put a cutoff that separates the linear radiation and the soft radiation. Cut off like that. Now, when you go through a complete set of proofs for factorization, there's more regions than just linear and soft. There's called the Glauber region. I'm not going to talk about it at all. Uh, you need to show that that factorizes. And in different ways of dealing with factorization, the way that these regions have come into the, the analysis is different. They either come in through the treatment study of the Feynman diagrams or its quantum fields, if you do that sheet. So, all of that additional details I leave for the future. Education or or not, <laughs> you know, or interested as you are, but I'm not going to get into those things here. So I want to understand sort of how do these things contribute to my TMD PDFs. So let me draw a picture for that. Make a nice big picture. So we're going to put minus momenta on one axis, plus momenta on another axis, and then if I think about something that has fixed Invariant mass e squared of order qt squared that corresponds to a hyperbola. Like this. So remember, for this for purpose of this, this plot, I'm going to get rid of the transverse direction, which will be out of the plane. So p squared is like p plus times p minus. So p minus is qt squared, a fixed number divided by p plus. So if I draw p minus versus p plus, it's a hyperbola like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you discuss collinear factorization, you picked off these soft gluons and put them in some Wilson line or whatever. You picked, picked the... off some gluons. They were actually collinear gluons. Right. In the, uh, yeah. But why don't you repeat that? Why did you distinguish between soft and collinear here? Yeah. Add a cutoff and all that. So I do have to repeat that. That same you know, factorization of the Wilson lines, and indeed, even further factorizations of the Wilson lines I have to repeat. And I'll say a few more words about that in a minute, although I won't go through all the details of it. But I do have to repeat it here as well. <laughs> Let me draw a picture of where, how these, how you should think about these two different types of degrees of freedom and why they're both contributing. So things that are on this hyperbola, have the right type of momenta to contribute to the final state that contributes to the TMD PDF. And we have after it, we have something with large minus momentum. And if it's the other PDF over here, we have large plus momenta that are in order Q. They're kind of on the opposite axis, we have this QT squared divided by Q. So there's two collision modes, one for the guys going this way, one for the guys going that way. I only do one of them here, but there's another one for the swap these for the other Yeah. And that's these two blue dots. And then in the center here, there's some soft radiation. Okay, so there's linear radiation along one proton direction, linear radiation along another proton direction. 
And all of these things are widely separated from the hard radiation, which is out here. It's minus momentum and plus momentum, both of order Q. And so if you like, with the mu that we introduced, we separated the hard physics from this hyperbola. Mu is an invariant mass cutoff, Brent's invariant cutoff. And so it's a cutoff on P squared. So it can distinguish between the hard radiation and the things that lie on this hyperbola because fixed mu squared is another hyperbola that can just draw in the middle here. But I can't with mu distinguish between this collinear and soft radiation. So I need another type of cutoff. And that's what this new parameter that I was talking about here is doing. It's effectively providing a cutoff that if I make it symmetric, I only need one parameter. It's more complicated, but let me imagine symmetric. That distinguishes the collinear from the soft radiation. Soft radiation is now in here, and then the collinear radiation beyond that. Yeah. Well, collinear includes all soft and hard. It can. Or, or is collinear always? So here I'm distinguishing between the like really collimated radiation and the radiation that is soft. I'm distinguishing between these two cases. And soft here means wide angle. Yeah. Small rapidity, almost zero. Yeah. Even though I mean, the anything, you know, there's some up to some cutoff, right? So I, I have to decide where do I what at what angle one was actually doing. At what angle do I decide that it's linear versus soft? Somewhere in the middle. Maybe I decide rapidity two or I you know. Make a choice, 1.5. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is this because soft radiation does come out at this rapidity mostly? And it, Yeah, it's because when you go through the factorization, both of these types of radiation come in, and you have to think about both cases and then see what happens. And I want to make sure that we're not missing anything. And I'll tell you in a minute that we can kind of put them back together. Um, just about there. Okay, so we have this, uh, this structure. So how does this relate to the factorization theorem that was about a minute ago? We only have this one TDDF. <laughs> Let me write that part again, but now I'll write it with these two different types of positive. I'll write it in Fourier space. There. So now I'm going to have some blue collinear objects. I'm going to fill in all the arg arguments now. One of the dots. Tell you what these variables are. And it times some soft object. I'll have twiddles on them to make it clear that they're very transforms. So the structure looks like that. Where there's some contribution from the green radiation, it can actually be factorized from the linear radiation. Um, I'll explain a little bit layer three how that factorization works. And but if you notice in this, this version of the formula, so this thing here is a proton matrix element, and this thing here is hanging out, it doesn't have a proton label on it, so it actually doesn't depend on the proton. This thing has a proton matrix element. I'll give you precise definitions of matrix elements for these things in the next layer. But the idea behind the TMD PDF is that this thing is. You can just absorb into this thing. Really, what we were talking about before with the TMD PDF can be thought of as just the combination of the B, which is the proton matrix element, perhaps the more important part, and this additional mass factor. When I combine these two things together, it's like combining back the whole hyperbola, right? It's like 
but I take square root of s. So I take part of it and stick it here, and I take part of it and take it, stick it there. This is the whole s. I take half of it and stick it there, and half of it and stick it there. That's what the square root of s is doing. So I have a formula like this for each of my TMD PDFs. And when I combine it back together, kind of the split parameter cancels out. So this, this thing on the left hand side no longer depends on the new variable. That's kind of where this F that we were talking about, how it can be thought of as capturing both types of radiation, the soft and the clear. Now, in this here, I have just written new, but here I wrote new over the CA, and that's effectively because there's sort of a, a these things have some uh, understanding of the rapidity, they're boosted, have some value of rapidity that's typical for them. And that's what this CA, the CB, Oh, they're called the SOPR parameters. That's called zeta A. So you can think of it as just a large plus momentum divided multiplied by a momentum fraction. It usually has momentum two. So these are the large components of the hadron momentum multiplied by fractions. For protonic variables, that's what they are. And really, the product of them, the important one is the product of them is always e to the fourth. So, it's like each of them is a order of two squared. These are some variables that are big variables, and they're sort of tracking the fact that e is a large Q makes a large Q. And so, when you put them back together for the PDF, Back on Let's do the first one. <laughs> so this zeta a, the zeta a parameter just now shows up here. Right, so I can write this back exactly in the form that we had a minute ago, except now I filled in the last argument. That's the zeta a. It comes out after this new dependence cancels out between these two objects, it's sort of you're still left with that zeta a. And it's a remnant sort of a fact that there was rapidity or something going on with the rapidity formula. And at the end of the day, there's something left over that has some knowledge of that the fact that there was this factorization of rapidity. Now, when you think about the normalization group, probably get to next the beginning of next lecture rather than today. When you think about the renormalization group, you can actually do renormalization group by changing these cutoffs, the U and the new. And in this formula for the F, you can change the zeta. As you can see from this formula that like changing zeta is the same as new. And so I can think about changing zeta as analogous to changing new. So you can do renormalization group both in, in the rapidity cutoffs as well as in this uh, new parameter. Okay, questions before I go on to layer three. Layer three is where I actually introduce matrix elements. Yeah. You never needed that. Like, why didn't you just regulate the collinear divergence with dimensional plane or reg dimensional regularization? Why did you choose to use a rapidity cutoff? Yeah. So dimension, I'll, I'll say it, but well, let me say it now since you asked, dimensional regularization will not regulate the divergences that come about in this cutoff. You need something beyond dimensional regularization. Dimensional regularization alone doesn't suffice. And that's because they're all in the same hyperbola. And you can't distinguish between them just by their invariant mass. So therefore, when you like write down some integral, it'll give you an example of that. Dimensional regularization will just leave over some integral that's not regulated. In the original integral where you had integrated over QT, yeah. where everybody was okay with dimensional regularization. That's right. So somewhere along the way, yeah. as you expand it. So to derive the factorization, you're forced to expand. If you don't expand, you don't have anything because you're not able to define these objects. So you're really forced to expand your amplitudes. And the expansion works slightly differently if particles are clear or particles are soft because the components have different size. So you're forced to expand differently in these two cases. 
And as soon as you start distinguishing the cases, you encounter exactly these yeah. Expanding about the various values of QT. So. Yeah, or the various momenta. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, expanding with momentum of various size, like if this momentum is QT, and there's some other plus momentum, I'm going to say this one's small. Okay, so let's finally get to operators. We had an operator from the longitudinal PDF. How does that work? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to use bare, we're going to write down bare operators. We're going to have to do some regularization. We'll use dimensional regularization. So I'll say D is four minus two epsilon. That'll mean we multiply the divergences. And I do that. We move the divergences to scale mu and we put off and it's on the field theory. There's going to be an analog for rapidity. And that is when we do alternative calculations, there's going to be rapidity divergences. So I'm going to need some type of rapidity regulator. That's the analog of the epsilon. So tau is a rapidity analog of 